Hello and welcome to The Journal, I'm Steve Kendall. Bowling Green State University's In the Round series features Native American creatives in an effort to make more visible the creations of Native American artists. We're joined by one of the speakers who will be part of that series, Talon Silverholm, who's a cultural program manager with the Ohio Division of Natural Resources. Uh, Talon, welcome to Journal Day and thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself because I, I've introduced you as, you know, working with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. But obviously, there's so much more about you. So give us an idea of your background and, uh, and why this is so important that we talk about uh, these things with Native American creative uh, activities. Sure. So, um, yeah, I am a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe from Oklahoma. I grew up uh, in Oklahoma on the Shawnee Reservation um, and... Uh, you know, I lived there and uh, went to school there and, you know, everything I did was there until I eventually uh, started traveling outside and, and meeting new people and um, came to realize that there was a lot that people didn't know, um, you know, that was available to them. And so um, I started working professionally in cultural education in museums, um, you know, hmm. places like Colonial Williamsburg, NMAI, um, et cetera. And then found uh, the skill of interpretation as sort of my niche in trying to communicate with people and build connections. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I know that we, you know, we talked about this, and obviously there's a lot of other things we're gonna to touch on, but uh, the university, of course, is trying to make sure that people understand that where the university sits, where we're, where we're sitting right now, was Native American Terry, as was all of North America, basically. Uh, and, to, and to remind us of the heritage, the cultural, uh, what was here before uh, there was, the, you know, where uh, Europeans moved in. So uh, where we're here in Northwest Ohio, obviously, Ottawa Territory, possibly Shawnee Territory. Uh, can you give us a little idea of, of the background of, of the tribes that were here, the Native Americans that were here, and, uh, and some of the things that we should look at culturally that we might take for granted every day as we drive around, walk around Northwest Ohio? Sure, yeah, so I mean, obviously Ottawa's and uh, especially Wyandots, Ottawa's and Wyandots, um, some of the uh, more Eastern Potawatomis, um, and uh, even some of the more Eastern Anishinaabeks. Um, there's a lot of people, I'm actually looking at an 18th century map uh, right now. And, um, you know, I mean, there are, especially on the Southern Lakes, lots of different people coming and going using those lakes as culturally significant and also just geographically significant areas. Um, so Bowling Green uh, and that, that greater Toledo area is all, uh, you know, very Ottawa, Wyandotte, some Seneca Cayugas, Potawatomis. And then, yeah, you noted that there is a Shawnee township not far from you mm -hmm. guys. Yeah. Um, so uh, Shawnees are, are pretty well traveled. We, mm -hmm. uh, we get around. Um, and uh, but I mean, yeah, so culturally speaking and, and, you know, talking about the people. Yeah, obviously, people sort of have this sense that there was someone here before. It's important mm -hmm. to know who that was historically. But then also the other part of that understanding is where are those people now? Mm -hmm. You know, where did they go if they're not still living here? Where are they today? Sure. So. And, and, and one of the things, of course, obviously, we know if you, what little bit of uh, this works its way into American history, and probably a lot more of it should, is, is the, the, as you said, that the, where, where those people are now, because this was their homeland, this was where they lived, this was their land. Uh, and, and as we know, we've, we've moved Native Americans all over America to areas that weren't necessarily culturally correct for them, let alone lifestyle correct, the, the life they were used to living. Some of the Great Lakes ends up in, in the Great Plains, not exactly the same sort of uh, situation. So talk a little about that, about, about the way we've, how, the, the things you want to bring and let people know that, yeah, People lived here, but we've moved them here. They're still, but they still maintained a lot of their culture, even though they were displaced from their their native ground. Yeah, that's actually one of the things that's pretty present for us living in Oklahoma is trying to. I mean, we've got Seneca Cayugas, Wyandots, Shawnees, Miamas, Ottawas. I mean, we live in. I lived in Ottawa County, uh, ah. and the Ottawas were right next door to us. So. Um, you know, there's 39 tribes that reside in Oklahoma today. Most of them do not originate from Oklahoma. Um, mm. We've got people from Northern California, from the Great Lakes, from the East Coast, um, just all over the place. Mm. And we're all trying to maintain our own individual cultures, even though we represent wildly different regions of the U.S. And so um, for me, growing up trying to be Shawnee in Oklahoma, uh, 
it is sort of difficult to hear and think about and try to imagine some of the you know stories that we tell the histories that we pass down uh, talking about the great lakes and the sort of um, spiritual world that goes along with the geography um, the medicines that grow in certain environments that have a hard time growing in oklahoma um, you know just everything about it the soil texture um, you know it all it all plays a part in it and i remember first coming to ohio for the first time and um, sort of having this epiphany of like looking around i think i was just i had stopped at a rest stop and i just looked around at this area behind this rest stop and there was a little creek and sandstone and horsetail and blood root and like everything that was like culturally significant was just there <laughs> so and it's so hard to find some of those things you know in oklahoma so um yeah the geography makes a huge difference yeah and it's interesting too that you mentioned that because obviously uh when people looked at their art and their culture and, and the way they worked their environment into what they did um, it's a good point that suddenly now you're seeing all of this this sort of history with the things you describe like plants and trees and rocks and things that and now suddenly you're in an area that doesn't it has it has things like that but they're not the ones that are culturally significant and, and it's interesting you mentioned the medicines because obviously there were a lot of remedies that were, were derived from the plants in the environment and as you said you can't necessarily find what you were using the great lakes area out in oklahoma as a shawnee or any other tribe and i think we have a tendency too to lump all of them, all of the tribes together, all of the Native Americans to into one category, and obviously there are, there is different as they are individually. The cultures are, are that different as well, too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, when you when you look at that, and you, as you mentioned, there are all of these different uh, Native American groups uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, has there been any sort of like, uh, like? transfer of culture among those different groups to some degree now that they're geographically close by? Yeah, one of the biggest things that we've sort of um, uh, begun to blend is our calendars. So oh. um, how we keep track of time, our seasonality, et cetera. Um, and that's mostly because like, as we've lived in Oklahoma for the last, you know, more than a, a hundred and hundred and, you know, some years, um, we uh all of our families are now you know our daughter is married to kiowa our son mm -hmm. has married a pawnee you know etc and so now it's like okay well we have a lot of different celebrations to keep track of and go to and so you start to see uh some of the calendars start to align and and uh you know certain times of year like in the springtime and fall um you know whether it be green corn or whether it be Sundance or what have you, like those types of celebrations uh, are now kind of <laughs> coming closer together, um, and a lot of multicultural families. And so you'll find bits and pieces of different practices, religions, um, you know, all sort of blended together uh, in in one home. And that's not too dissimilar from what's been happening in in all of history. Uh, it's just that now we have sort of a lot of different cultures condensed into a small area. For example, Ottawa County in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. highest concentration of federally recognized tribes in the country with nine tribes in one county. Ah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah. it's just yeah. up to a greater degree. Yeah, when we come back, I'd like to talk more about about calendars and time and, and those sort of things, because those are we, you know, we take for granted we're working on a 24, you know, a 12 hour clock, 24 hour day. But uh, obviously, each of the each of the groups had different ways and different, as you said, different seasons, different events, different cultural things went on. So we come back. Let's talk a little about that. And as you mentioned too, you've got these groups now concentrated in one area, and so the the differences, the similarities, the way things have sort of assimilated a little bit too. So uh, back in just a moment, our guest is Talon Silverhone. He's going to be a speaker at the Bowling Green State University in the round series, an ongoing series. Back in just a moment here on the Journal. Thank you for staying with here on the Journal. Our guest is Talon Silverhorn, Cultural Programs Manager, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, but uh, so much more than that, obviously, and, and that's an important part of what he does, and we'll be talking more about uh, Department of Natural Resources and how uh, the cultural programs are, are trying to get us more in tune and aware of the uh, culture of the Native American culture of Ohio. Uh, when we left that last segment, we were talking about the fact that, as you said, you have nine tribes, nine groups now concentrated in one county, which would have been not necessarily the way it would have been in the 1700s uh, back in history. Um, 
you mentioned the fact that they all have had all had different cultures, different ways of keeping track of time, different celebrations, different ways of, of doing things. So talk about that, how that has uh, as con that concentration has changed and, and and how different tribes be able were able to adapt to each other that way, because we we tend to think of them as being isolated individual units. But the reality is they were interacting back before the, the white man showed up on the continent. Yeah, very much so. So, I mean, even historically, we'll start historically and then we'll talk about today. So in history, I mean, tribes are much more, um, I'm much more familiar with each other than people might think. You know, we do kind of get this very sort of fenced off kind of pocket, you know, um, people live here, people live here, and they don't talk to each other. But that's not the case. Um, one account from the latter 18th century, a young man by the name of Jonathan Alder, uh, talks about how his adopted mother is Shawnee, his adopted father is Mingo, uh, probably Seneca or Cayuga from um, Canada. And all of the kids that he played with growing up um, were Seneca, Shawnee, Delaware. They spoke different languages um, because all of, you know, all of those people there had come from other places and were now living in that town. And it's just the same way today. Um, you know, we have nine federally recognized tribes in Ottawa County, um, you know, and our calendars, our celebrations, even though historically we might have been celebrating those things within our own little communities, um, doing those independently, you know, now being all together and having all of our people and families kind of blended together, um, it could sort of forms this year long sort of pattern and celebration oh. where it's like, you know, everybody's new year happens at a slightly different time. Everybody's summer celebrations happens at a slightly different time. Um, whether it be your green corns or your sun dances or those things like that. And then your winter celebrations, your winter uh, ceremonies and things, it, it sort of forms this continuous line, this like schedule for the year that everybody acknowledges and sort of, uh, you know, uh, you'll see the same cast of people coming to every tribe's, you know, uh, celebration, gathering, you know, uh, ceremony, et cetera. So uh, you get to, there's a pretty tight knit community around just going to those and, and being present and helping out, so. Yeah, it's interesting too, and, and when you talk about uh, time, uh, was there a difference in the way that say, the Senecas in New York kept track of, of the seasons, the time, that sort of thing versus uh, the Ottawa or the Shawnee or uh, another group? I mean, how was it, was it geographical because simply the way the sun moved across the sky and, and light and dark and that sort of thing? Or what was, how, how did they actually keep track of, of time and, versus the way we have, we think of time now? Yeah, so I mean, so without the presence of a clock mm -hmm. uh, and a set you know, schedule to your day, um, a lot of tribes are keeping track of time through the movements, like cyclical movements in nature, whether that be stars, whether that be mm -hmm. season, certain plants, um, so, for example, Shawnees have uh, 13 seasons traditionally. Um, uh -huh. Think of those sort of like our month, uh, our months, um, uh -huh. and uh, each one of those corresponds to a different resource that exists around us. Whether it be our maple sugaring time, our deer hunting time, um, you know, whether it be the time that you know we we make bread, um, you know, all of those things have their own particular season. So um, there are 13 of those. Uh, that has to do with uh, the way that the moon uh, mm -hmm. actually moves, the cycle of the moon. And um, and so, you know, within that, I mean, our new year basically is in the springtime, uh, uh, not, not anywhere in one, but in the springtime. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, uh, so those types of things might be, might be different than, uh, you know, agricultural based societies mm -hmm. like Sean versus uh, more hunter-gatherer societies or fishing-based societies, you know, I mean, their calendars are going to be re revolve around what's important to them, mm -hmm. um, whether that be the movements of the sun uh, or moon as an agricultural people or the movements of animals, you know, so. Yeah, well, it's interesting, too, because you mentioned, you know, New Year's in the spring, which in a way makes a lot more sense than New Year's and what we, you know, in January where it's the middle of winter, spring would be the time where everything would be new. So it would kind of make sense that that would be the start of another cycle, another another year or another cycle like that. Um, when you 
go out and, and do the presentations that you do. And I know uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is the, uh, the effort to provide, especially at Ohio's parks, uh, more interpretation, more background on Native American culture. Uh, what are some of the things that you, that you really emphasize when you, when you talk to people uh, you know, like me who don't have you know, the background I should have in this? Obviously, I, I live in Ohio. Indian names all over the place, Native American names, streets, counties, cities. Uh, you can't cross it. You can't go, you know, 100 yards probably anywhere in, in Northwest Ohio and not encounter a Native American name on a, lo on a location. Uh, what are some of the things you talk about and how those things, uh, how we had adopted, you know, some of those things and, and made them somewhat part of our culture, but really they were, they were really Native American culture to begin with? Yeah, I, actually, I've used that very same example. You can't go, you know, you can't throw a stick in the air in Ohio without it landing on a place that is named for <laughs> person or tribe, um, you know, or even a traditional place like Wapakoneta, um, which is a Shawnee, a Shawnee word, um, you know. And so, but the thing that you probably won't find in that place are Native people. Mm -hmm. um, so my goal in doing educational programs and getting out and talking to people um, is not only to sort of get everybody on the same page on our history. That's important because there's so many different, uh, you know, understandings, misunderstandings, mythologies um, that sort of just really muddy the waters when it comes to our history. Mm -hmm. uh, and so much of the relationship that we as Native people have to everyone else around us is is based on that history. So it's important to have a clear understanding of it. But the second half of that, and arguably the most important half of that, is getting beyond the history, understanding where we are today, how we live today, and 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 then sort of using that as a platform to think about our future, right? Because we as tribal people, uh, you know, we are concerned with what we're gonna do tomorrow, next week, next year, next 10 years, next 20 years, but most people are still stuck asking questions about um, what we did 200, 300 years mm -hmm. ago um, and haven't progressed past the point. They haven't found any value in looking at us as modern people because they're still stuck on trying to understand our history. So mm -hmm. if we can get all on the same page on that, then I think we can get to a different topic, get to somewhere else and start having different conversations. Yeah. Well, we come back because we'll, we'll got one more segment here. Let's talk a little about, about how Native American tribal people would like to be viewed versus the way, as you say, the way that we tend to put them in a box and say, well, this is, they're just the way they were. We, it's funny because we don't look at other people like that, but them it's like, oh, they're still doing what they did 200 years ago, but it's not that at all. So uh, back in just a moment, our guest is Talon Silverhorn, uh, cultural programs manager, Ohio Department of Real Sources. He's gonna be talking about the In the Round series here in Bowling Green in just a few days. Back in just a moment on The Journal. You're with us on The Journal. Our guest is Talon Silverhorn, and we're talking about uh, tribal people, Native Americans, part of the Bowling Green State University In the Round series, which is an effort to make sure that we understand not just the history of Native Americans and tribal people, but, but who they are today as well. And uh, uh, Talon, one of the things as we left that last segment was the fact that uh, we tend to view tribal people, Native Americans, the way we think they were 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, and the reality is, Yes, they still appreciate their culture, but there is a contemporary tribal people. They're they're not the not the Native Americans of the movies or the Native Americans of TV shows or Saturday afternoon serials at the at the movies that kind of thing. So, uh, talk about the the myth between how we view Native Americans in culture in our historical culture versus the way we should be able to view them now as contemporary American citizens. Sure. So to start off with, there are two kind of big trains of thought, one of which is the idea that, you know, uh, sort of mythologizing Native people that we still do the things that we did 200, 300 years ago uh, and are still sort of living the same way, which is not true. It's not true for really anyone in, in the world for the most part. Um, and, uh, you know, people are sometimes disappointed by that, that we're not doing the same things that we did uh, in the past. There's also another train of thought that's very, very similar where, um, you know, people ascribe our identity so wholly to history that yeah. if we don't do the things we did in the past, then they don't view us as modern Native people as real mm. Native people. 
Um, and so it's almost like they're expecting either, um, you know, a, a reenactment or, you know, something along those lines, uh, sort of as our daily life. And that's just not the case, you know. Um, what we, what I would like people to see and, and experience is what I grew up with, which is a very diverse community of individuals who have different political opinions, different social and economic statuses, who um, have different jobs and are interested in different things, who want different educations. I mean, there's a whole nother community of people that most Americans just aren't able, you know, to see and, and sort of view as a tangible thing. Um, and so, you know, getting, like I said, beyond the history mm -hmm. and thinking about our future, you know, uh, what will collaboration look like in 10 or 20 years um, between education, educational institutions, between cultural institutions, uh, historical and archaeological institutions, I mean, how will tribal participation and tribal cooperation look like? Um, and, and what sort of opportunities can we create to diversify what's available to our citizens? Because we don't want them to feel like Christmas elves, like, you know, uh, like it's making toys is the only thing they can do. Like history is the only thing that is valuable for us as Native people to do. Computer science and engineering and art and all of these, I mean, there's so much that um, you know, our our people have talent in, but aren't able to express because it's not uh, quote unquote what's expected mm -hmm. or, or yeah, um, and that's kind of what Great Council uh, looks to sort of touch on as well. I didn't know if we wanted to talk about about uh, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting because we're looking at the In the Round series, which is an effort to make sure people don't forget. The culture and, and realize what was what was here prior to uh, the the European movement across the across the continent, um, and yet at the same time you're trying to make sure look that's not the only that's not all we are that's not all we're, we're yeah we're we're contemporary citizens we do uh, that sort of thing and yet and yet we're uh, we try to sort of isolate that in a box and say well but if you're not culturally historic Native Americans, then what are you kind of, which uh, is interesting. Now, uh, one of the things I know you, you work a lot with the Ohio parks and uh, obviously there's, a, there's a, a big center that's going to be, uh, ground has been broken for that, but talk a little about what you do with the Department of Natural Resources to make sure that people understand the culture, but also understand the modern culture as well, the contemporary Native American culture. Sure. So I am a naturalist supervisor with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources um, and also cultural programs manager. Um, what that has meant in the last two years that I've been working with ODNR has been a lot of sort of background administration, like um, updating park signage, updating websites, the language, just sort of giving everybody a base level of understanding. And then also to making sure that when we talk about tribal histories or tribal cultures at our 75, soon to be 76 state parks, um, that we are giving people the opportunity to connect with not only the history of those people, but also the contemporary identity of those people if they want to as well. So things like QR codes, links to tribal websites, making sure that that is as accessible as possible. But with the new state park, uh, Great Council State Park, mm -hmm. which is um, in construction and is coming along very well, um, that's going to be a place where we tell the story of the intersections between not only tribal people, but um, white traders and settlers, um, sort of early statehood. I mean, we'll cover a lot. We'll cover the archaeology of Western Ohio, the history of the Shawnee people from contact to removal to Oklahoma, and then actually a large focus on where we are today and what we look like today, our vital statistics, populations, our political structures, uh, our citizens and their lifestyles. Um, we really want to give people a both feet into the river kind of, you know, introduction to uh, Shawnee people and our culture. Now, and we've got just a, a few seconds here. If people want to find out more about what you're describing, what you're talking about, what you're trying to uh, make sure people are aware of, is there, what's the easiest way for them to do that? If they go online, is there, do they, what, what should they Google? What should they look for and say, if they want to know more about this, not just historical, but also, the, as you said, the contemporary uh, view of tribal peoples? Yeah, if you want to learn more about the new state park, Great Council State Park would be the mm -hmm. thing to Google. Um, I would also very much recommend either the Shawnee Tribe Cultural Center 
um, or the uh, Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma's website, um, you know, to learn more about the people themselves, always go to the source. Yeah. Um, great, great, good. Well, thank you so much for being on, Talon, and, uh, and best wishes. Good luck with all of the things you're doing, because obviously it's important that we don't forget our history, but we also need to evolve that as well so that we understand each other uh, a lot better as we move forward. So thank you again for being here. You can yeah, check. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you can check us out at wbgu.org. Uh, you can also, of course, watch us every Thursday night at eight o'clock on WBGU PBS. We'll see you again next time. Good night and good luck. <laughs>